Welcome back. We're in the middle of our discussion of the Progressive Era Amendments, and we're going to focus in particular on the 16th, 17th, and 19th Amendments. The 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, reaffirms the power of the federal government to impose a tax on income. Um, and I say reaffirms because, in my view, the federal government always had this power. Remember, the Constitution is basically a pro-tax revolution enacted shortly after the anti-tax revolution of 1776. The Constitution is all about taxation with representation. The, the Declaration of Independence and the American colonies opposed, um, uh, it said, said the Declaration of Independence in effect said, and the colonists uh, at the revolution said, no taxation without representation. And the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, is all about taxation with representation. And we need taxation for various purposes, uh, most dramatically national defense. Uh, and the, um, the longest section of the, cons the longest article is Article 1, and the longest section is Section 8. And Section 8 begins by saying Congress shall have power to basically tax you up and down and sideways, impose taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. How many ways can they basically say that you're going to be taxed, but don't worry, or uh, at least it, it, there's a reason why, maybe you should worry, but there's a reason why we need taxation for national security, and it will be legitimate because Congress will be representative. And in my view, there was nothing about a federal income tax that was distinctively problematic. Um, and uh, Abraham Lincoln thought the same thing. And during the Civil War, um, he signs his name to a law that imposes an income tax, and it's a progressive income tax. It taxes people who make um, who have more income at a higher rate, and it, and, and it exempts people who, who uh, um, make below a certain amount. Those are the two basic features of a progressive income tax. A progressive income tax basically takes proportionately more from the people who are making more money by exempting people below a certain amount and by having higher tax rates um, proportionately for um, uh, uh, people who are uh, higher uh, income earners. So Lincoln signs uh, an income tax a statute uh, in the middle of the Civil War, and it's upheld by courts. Many states had income taxes, all of which generally were, were progressive. Um, but um, the Supreme Court at the end of the 19th century did an about face and said, ah, income taxes are unconstitutional. And that's in part because the party of Lincoln, which begins as an anti-slavery party, eventually, because of, uh, it becomes the dominant party, the, the Democrats have discredited themselves because of uh, slavery and secession. Um, Lincoln's dominant political party attracts a lot of, of money and other things, so it morphs from a kind of an anti-slavery party to a, a, a corporate party. The party of Lincoln becomes the party of Grant, becomes the party of McKinley. Um, and in that era, the Supreme Court, uh, by a five to four vote over an emphatic dissent, by John Marshall Harlan, the first John Marshall Harlan, the same guy who dissents in the, in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, but over his emphatic dissent, he says this ruling is going to be a disaster for the country, but over his dissent, five justices proclaim an income tax unconstitutional because it's, quote, in their view, a direct tax which requires state apportionment. I'm not going to go into all the details except to say that that I don't buy it. Uh, a lot of constitutional scholars who have studied the matter don't buy it. A lot of tax experts who have studied the matter carefully don't buy it. The direct tax language of the Constitution was very much bound up with all sorts of compromises about slavery. It was, uh, they were ways of camouflaging some of the pro-slavery aspects of the Constitution um, by linking the, uh, the idea of apportionment, representation, with taxation, but direct taxation. As I said, I'm not going to go into all the details except to say that I don't think an income tax is an improper direct tax within the mean of the Constitution. A direct tax is something that you simply can't avoid at all, a head tax, putting a tax of $10 on every person. Well, you just can't avoid that, short of death. That's a direct tax. It's also called a capitation. And one of the reasons the framers tried to limit direct taxes is they didn't want early Congresses to be able to, in effect, prevent the importation of of, uh, of slaves from abroad by, by taxing 
um, slave importation or taxing slaves themselves. So the, the, there were various pro-slavery compromises built into some of the language about direct tax, but even at the founding, I think it meant something very narrow. You can avoid an income tax, just don't make income. Um, uh, live off of um, uh, uh, your, your savings, um, do other things. So, so uh, 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 an, an income tax is not a direct tax. Um, maybe land taxes of a certain sort were also seen as direct taxes. Direct taxes on, on, on pieces of real property, um, but, but an income tax, I think, at the founding was understood as a permissibly transactional indirect tax that was perfectly okay, um, and so thought Abraham Lincoln and his generation, and the court originally upheld it, but then they invalidated it. And the American people basically rose up against the Supreme Court. Only four times in American history have the American people responded to a Supreme Court decision by overturning it by amendment, the 11th Amendment, when the judiciary early on went too far in expanding its own powers, that um, in a case called Chisholm versus Georgia, and that generated the 11th Amendment. Dred Scott went too far in a whole bunch of ways, and the 14th Amendment repudiated the Dred Scott case. Uh, the Pollock case, this income tax case, is repudiated by um, the income tax amendment, the 16th Amendment, and then there's going to be one more later in our story, so stay tuned on that one. Um, now, uh, members of both parties supported the income tax amendment. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt and, and, and William Howard Taft for the Republicans. Um, uh, uh, Woodrow Will at the Democratic Party had, was also on board. So um, amendments succeed um, when both parties are in favor of them, and that's what happens with the 16th Amendment. Um, which, as I said in my earlier lecture, my previous lecture, sort of laid the foundation in some very important ways for the, the modern redistributive estate. Our, the income taxes have, um, that we've had have always, at least in theory, been um, progressive redistributive income taxes. In practice, one can, one can raise questions. The 17th Amendment, also adopted in the, um, uh, uh, the 19-teens, as was the uh, uh, income tax amendment, the early 19 teens, the income tax amendment provides for the direct election of senators. And you might wonder why would existing senators ever go for that? Because remember, no amendment can pass unless two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate and three quarters of the states say yes. So why would existing senators who are basically picked by state legislatures ever vote to change the rules by which senators are picked? And part of the answer is, by the time the 17th Amendment comes along, a bunch of senators are already kind of directly elected. There have been improvisations in the founder system. These improvisations begin as early as the 1850s with the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates in the wake of the Dred Scott case. In 1858, Abe Lincoln wants to be U.S. Senator from Illinois, and Stephen Douglas, who's the current U.S. Senator, wants to be re-elected. Uh, legally, strictly speaking, the uh, senator is going to be picked by the Illinois state legislature. But what Lincoln and Douglas do, what the political parties do, the first, the political parties basically say, before the state legislative election, the Democrats say, we're going to nominate Stephen Douglas, and the Republicans say, we're for Abe Lincoln for Senate, and they announce that before the state legislative election. Now the state legislative election kind of becomes a referendum of sorts on whether you're a Lincoln man or a Douglas man. If you're a Lincoln man, vote Republican for state legislature. If you're a Douglas man, vote Democrat for state legislature. Now it's not perfect. It's not a perfect referendum because there's some malapportionment and gerrymandering and not all districts are um, open in the election and there might be other issues that you care about other than Lincoln versus Douglas. So it's not perfect, but but the election in 1858 for a state legislature was kind of rough referendum on whether you preferred Lincoln or Douglas. And in fact, Lincoln got slight, Lincoln's supporters cast slightly more votes than Douglas' supporters, but not quite enough to swing the election in his favor. Later generations of Americans will sort of further improvise toward a direct election system. In states that have basically, like, where one party is dominant, um, the key becomes uh, to election becomes winning the party nomination, and if the state uses a primary system to pick its um, a nominee, well, then the primary becomes, in effect, the direct election. Um, and a bunch of states, basically, especially in the South, were one-party states. The Democratic Party um, was uh, the, the dominant party in, in some western, in some southern states. Um, 
uh, and um, uh, there were other one-party states in the, in the Midwest. Um, so primaries were a kind of direct election. Oregon improvised a different system. Oregon basically said, when you vote for Congress, for a U.S. Senator, for a member of the House of Representatives, for state legislature, uh, when you vote, we're going to put on the ballot a non-binding question. The non-binding question is, whom do you prefer for the U.S. Senate? Okay, and there were different iterations of it. The first version, like whom do you prefer, and then you know we're going to have, actually have a second question. State legislators have to either promise to support the winner of the beauty contest. The beauty contest is who do you want for you as senator? So you either, you know, I'll, um, if you're running for state legislature, your name appears on the ballot, and whether you're Republican or Democrat, and whether you've taken the pledge. I pledge to support the beauty contest winner. So if you pledge to support the beauty contest winner, even if you're a Democrat, if the Republican wins the beauty contest, you're promising to vote for the Republican for U.S. Senate. So um, second version is you know, your name and, and whether you've taken the pledge, or, and your party and whether you've taken the pledge. And an earlier and later version is you're actually required to honor your pledge. Now, what exactly that means, is that constitutional? But in any event, by the time the 17th Amendment comes along, a bunch of, of senators are already kind of directly elected through some version of the Oregon plan or through the primary system in one-party states. Um, and the 17th Amendment's adoption is a great dem democratizing um, uh, um, moment that will actually have reverberations uh, later on. Um, it's going to, for example, help um, make it easier for the U.S. Supreme Court much later to insist on one person, one vote for state legislative elections. Why? Because when state legislatures picked U.S. senators, um, remember state legislatures might be kind of malapportioned, and that malapportionment would uh, be the basis for the, the U.S. Senator's election and re-election. So U.S. Senators would have a stake in state legislative malapportionment b before the 17th Amendment. And it, they might make it hard for justices to invalidate state legislative malapportionment because, remember, justices has to have to be confirmed by the Senate. But with the 17th Amendment, now U.S. Senators are going to be elected one person, one vote statewide. They don't have a particular stake in state legislative malapportionment anymore. Um, think about how the 17th Amendment has kind of transformed the presidency. Before the 17th Amendment, members of the House were directly elected. Yes, they were more numerous, they were less prestigious. Um, senators were smaller, more elite, more prestigious, but they weren't directly elected. So maybe a person from the House could say, you know, I'm more of a populist politician than a person from the Senate. Well, after the 17th Amendment, senators become every bit as populist as House members, but elected statewide for six-year terms, a much more select body. So. No member of the, before the 17th Amendment, various people went from the House of Representatives to the presidency without having their ticket punched in the Senate. After the 17th Amendment, we haven't had any of those types, um, who include people like James Madison, for example, James K. Polk. Um, but not since the 17th Amendment has a mere House member, a non-senator, won the presidency, uh, like Newt Gingrich or Dick Gephardt, something like that. Um, 17th Amendment has even changed um, how we think about um, the cabinet. Uh, uh, at the founding, um, uh, your state legislature sends you to the Senate, but they might prefer that you be in the cabinet. You can deliver all sorts of goodies to the state, so here's what they tell you. Go, to the Senate, go into the cabinet, we'll hold your seat, and when you're done with your cabinet service, you can go back, to, uh, we'll, we'll give you your Senate seat back. Uh, cabinet sandwiches, Senate to cabinet, back to Senate. There were a bunch of those before the 17th Amendment. That's not an easy deal. You can strike with the electorate at large. It doesn't quite work. So before the 17th Amendment, lots of cabinet sandwiches. After the 17th Amendment, no cabinet sandwiches. People leave the Senate to go into the cabinet, but they don't go back to the Senate. Lloyd Benson, um, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, and others. They might leave the Senate to go to the cabinet, but they don't count on going back to the the Senate anymore. So the 17th Amendment has actually kind of changed all sorts of other um, aspects of government. Senators used to be much more commonly picked as Supreme Court justices. 
since this, uh, in recent decades, not so much. Maybe that's because now U.S. Senators have to be much more populist politicians than before when they were sort of more elite statesmen. Maybe their earlier job description was a little closer to what a Supreme Court justice does, and their new job description is rather different. You have to be a populist politician, and maybe that's in slight tension with the kind of persona and personality that makes for the best Supreme Court justice. So the direct election of senators has had some um, all sorts of interesting in direct effects, if you will, over the cabinet, over presidential um, uh, 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 elections, um, uh, um, and uh, um, over the scope of national power, as I argued um, earlier, that, 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 that uh, senators are going to be much more willing to um, vote for, for um, uh, nationalist projects. Um, you're going to need a lot of money, maybe, to run for the Senate, and so People who thought the senators, Senate wasn't going to be a millionaire's club anymore if we have direct election, not so sure that they turned out to be right. But maybe the money is getting spread around in, in democratic campaigns rather than in bribes into the pockets of, of, of state lawmakers, for example, old-style state legislators. So, so the 17th Amendment has actually reconfigured our system, I think, in all sorts of, of, of interesting ways. But by far... The most important amendment, it seems to me, of the progressive era is the 19th Amendment. Direct, um, excuse me, um, uh, uh, the woman's suffrage amendment. Um, it's, in effect, a doubling of the franchise. So now, um, uh, by the numbers, maybe the most democratic event in all of American history. Um, and now let's take a step back and try to figure out how that happened. Because here's the real interesting thing. Before women get the vote, only men are voting, and only men are going to therefore be voting on whether women vote. So how do women ever sort of bootstrap themselves into the vote? Because they can't vote themselves the vote. They have to rely on men to, to vote first. So how does that ever happen? Um, and the answer is gradually, uh, it takes 50 years for women basically to get the vote from the Civil War era when black men get the vote with the 15th Amendment and women are shut out and they're, they're very disappointed. Um, it takes 50 years from that for them to finally prevail, the 19th Amendment, um, 1920. Um, and as with many constitutional reforms, this one begins first in the states. Federalism is an important part of our story here. Um, uh, national security is also going to come into the story. So it's going to be a story of democracy and its relationship to federalism and national security. Here's the federalism story. Remember this, the great American project of populating the West, this epic story of taking these um, uh, th this a nearly virgin soil um, and, and creating um, uh, civilized structures um, uh, which will eventually, um, and populating them and eventually admitting these regimes on equal footing with the older states. It's an amazing project and, and part of that in places like Wyoming are getting people to come to Wyoming and in particular getting women to come to Wyoming because in 1870, Wyoming, basically, which is a territory, has, um, I think, five white men for every white woman. And they're desperate. They want women to come. And they're so desperate that they actually start saying, well, maybe we should actually listen to what women say. Women say they want to vote. So we're going to let them vote. If they come to Wyoming, we'll let them vote. And hey, they say they want equal pay for equal work. We'll promise equal pay, too. So Wyoming first promises this, uh, the Wyoming uh, territory, and, and um, Wyoming and Utah and Idaho and um, Colorado are the first states to promise women the vote. And the interesting thing is these are the states where there aren't very many women. Um, and in a way, when you step back, it makes sense because if men and women in a jurisdiction are 50-50, and you give women the vote, and it turns out to be a mistake. Because remember, the rest of the world isn't doing this yet. So you're, you experiment. You give women the vote, and if it's 50-50, then you can't undo it. But if you outnumber them five to one, you give them the vote, it's a mistake, maybe you can take it back. Places where the men outnumber the women are also places where the men are most desperate to get women to come, emigrate, and, and so supply and demand meets in a good place for women's suffrage in those jurisdictions. So it's a federalism story to some degree. Men 
the, the place, w the irony is the place where women get the vote first are the place where they're the fewest women. And that's not just true, Wyoming. And that's not just true in, in America, but in the world. The state where the country that first gives women the vote is New Zealand, which is kind of the Wyoming of the, the British Empire, where men outnumber women. In Australia, which also has kind of territories, a federal system, the places where um, uh, uh, women are fewest, Western Australia, the kind of Wyoming of Australia, gives women the vote earlier. So this is a story that, that it's true more internationally, but then here's the second part of it. So, so some states experiment. Federalism, laboratories of experimentation. And states are innovating here just as states first had bills of rights and written constitutions and um, uh, three branches of government and bicameral legislatures and states are getting rid of slavery first. And, and so states are leading the way on all sorts of things. States are putting constitutions to special votes first. So here's a few states are giving women the vote and the sky does not fall. So the other states start to follow suit eventually. I'm saying, well, if you're going to come all the way um, uh, across the plains and over the mountains, you know, why stop in Wyoming? Come all the way to California. You know, come to Oregon. Um, come to Washington. So other states start following suit at the beginning of the 20th century. By 1909, only, only four states with only 2% of, of America's um, uh, women, um, Colorado, Utah, uh, Idaho and Wyoming. 1909, only four states. But by 1915, 16, a whole bunch of states have begun to join the bandwagon. Um, and now, if you want to run for president, you are a U.S. senator, you have to be in favor of women's suffrage. Because if you're not in favor of women's suffrage, you're conceding all those women's suffrage states. So one senator from Ohio, he's opposed to women's suffrage. His name is Atlee Pomerine, and you've never heard of him. The other Ohio senator who's in favor of women's suffrage, his name is Warren G. Harding, and he's going to get himself elected president on those women's votes. So, so, so once you see it start happening in a bunch of other states, you say, if you're a national politician who wants to be president, and that means lots of folks in the Senate, hey, I want to be in favor of that. And once you see different states um, um, voting um, taking votes on women's suffrage, and women's suffrage losing, let's say, 70-30 in the first vote. And then, but the women keep pushing, and then the next time women's suffrage loses, because remember, only the men are voting for it, on, on it. Um, so it loses 70-30. Then the next time, three years later, they get on the ballot again in the state, and it loses 60-40. And then they get on the ballot yet again, you know, three years later, because they're persistent, these women's suffragettes. And then it only loses 55-45, and now you think, eventually they're going to win. And if they win, do I want to be the last politician standing in the schoolhouse door resisting women's suffrage? Because as soon as they win, they're going to vote me out of office. So I have to pay attention not just to the men who voted for me, but the women whom I might need for my re-election. And so you go from only 2% of America's women voting in 1909 to 100% in 1920. Once male politicians think that women are going to get the vote, it becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then everyone kind of clambers on the bandwagon, wants to jump aboard it so that they're not on the wrong side of politics and history. So that's a federalism story. It's a story about incentive, political incentives. Um, it's also, though, the story of women's suffrage, is, and it's a story of women being very emphatic and, and working tirelessly again and again and again to get this. Women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and, and uh, their successors. Um, but it's also a story of national security, because what else is happening in this period? America is at war, World War I, and Woodrow Wilson initially opposes women's suffrage. He's a Southerner. Actually, he pretends he's a New Jersey person, but he's born in Staunton, Virginia. He grew up in, in Georgia. People in Georgia don't like the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed equal right, uh, voting rights for uh, blacks, so they don't want a 19th Amendment that's going to basically be the same thing except for sex, more federal intrusion into state voting regimes. Southerners don't like that. De Wilson is a Democrat. He's a Southerner. That's the base of the Democrat Party. He's inheriting still Thomas Jefferson's party, so initially he's not in favor of it. But then the women start shaming him. they chaining themselves to the White House gate and demanding um, rights for women, saying, you're in a war, and you say it's a war for democracy, and, and yet you don't let your own women vote. And we're part of the war efforts. Yes, we're not on the battlefield, but we are providing the economic support um, that's um, helping the war effort. Um, and, uh, and so Wilson switches. And here's one of the other reasons that he switches.
he believes that this war stands for, is about something, and, and eventually he wants it to be a war to end all wars. He wants to have a League of Nations that will emerge after the war, a League of Nations in which the United States is going to have to be involved so these European countries don't kill each other again, you know, and, and suck America in. So the United States is going to have to play a central role in the League of Nations as sort of the arbiter of old world disputes. Um, and he, as president, Woodrow Wilson, will be the leader of the free world. That's a new now um, job description of the president, not just commander-in-chief and veto-in-chief and appointer-in-chief, but leader of the free world. And he's imagining that for himself, and he's imagining that vision for the United States. But the United States will not be able to lead a League of Nations, which is going to be based on ideas and morals and not just who has the most military might. The United States will not have that moral leadership. And Wilson very much thinks of himself um, in terms of being a moral leader, won't have that credibility if we don't let, here in America, our women vote, especially because around the world other societies are beginning to let their women vote. So Woodrow Wilson comes personally to the Senate of the United States dramatically. And since Jefferson, um, uh, presence basically had only sent messages to Congress. They didn't appear personally um, before Congress. But Wilson shatters that precedent um, and, and it goes and appears personally before the Congress in, uh, for various things. And one of them is an appeal to Congress to get them to, to support a woman's suffrage amendment as a war measure. Um, and he's explicit that this is as well. And now both parties eventually join on board, the Republicans and the Democrats, because if woman suffrage is going to happen, you don't want the other party to get the credit without your party getting the credit too. And Republicans say, well, we're the party of Lincoln and we gave you the 15th Amendment, so now we're going to do it again with the 19th. And the Democrats say, we're the party of Woodrow Wilson and he's in favor of it, so we are too. And you get the 19th Amendment and the world will not be the same. Woman's suffrage, I think, transforms the nature of, women, women's, uh, of, of American politics. Today, more women vote than men. If women all voted for the same candidate, they could basically decide every election in the country. And if the men are close to evenly divided, the women decide. That's because of the transformative 19th Amendment. Um, uh, and I'm going to come back to that in... Um, uh, well, let me just tell you that that's what this... this um, uh, Depiction is all about women crusading for women's votes, marching in New York City. I think this is in 1912 or so. I believe they're marching down Broadway. Um, I'm going to come back to this at the very end. There are other amendments of the Progressive Era. The 18th Amendment gives you prohibition, and the 21st Amendment takes it away, um, and sort of undoes it. There's an amendment about um, uh, having the presidential term begin in January rather than um, January 20th after the November election rather than in March. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about that amendment um, in my next pair of lectures because that amendment is designed to reduce the lame duck period. Someone gets elected in November, but they have to wait all the way till January before taking office. It turns out, and before the 20th Amendment, they have to wait all the way till March. It turns out there's a way of having the person who won the election, let's say Romney had won the election against Obama, having that person take office not in January, but the day after the election. It turns out there's a way to do that, and that has to do with a later amendment, a later 20th century amendment, uh, 20th century amendment that we're going to talk about in the next pair of lectures, the 25th Amendment. Um, so we're going to talk about that in the next uh, a set of lectures. And we're also going to talk about another generation of Americans that takes to the streets. The women are taking to the streets to right a great historical wrong and injustice, that they've been excluded from the franchise, and that's not right. And they take to the streets in the 19-teens, and they prevail 50 years later, another half century later, a new generation will arise, another generational spurt, uh, spurt of amendments. And this generation will once again take to the streets to right some great historic injustices and wrongs. And that's the story that we're going to tell, among others, in the next pair of lectures. So stay tuned.